Uh, I'm delighted to welcome all those participating in this uh, webinar with, with Jacqueline Novogratz, who is universally recognized as the founder of the Acumen Fund and author of the newly published book, Manifesto for a Moral Revolution, Practices to Build a Better World. With all the challenges that we are currently facing, a pandemic, the environmental crisis, and the growing tensions between the affluent and the dispossessed, and the Black Lives Matter movement. This is a very timely event and a chance to hear from Jacqueline. So just a few words from me by way of background before I hand over to Harriet Moll, Creative Director of Charlotte Street Partners, who will lead the interview. Acumen was founded in 2001 by Jacqueline, uh, and it is a non-profit impact investment fund with nearly 20 years experience in investing in social enterprises that serve low-income communities in developing countries across sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Latin America, and the United States. It, it aims to demonstrate that small amounts of philanthropic capital combined with large doses of business acumen can result in thriving enterprises that serve vast numbers of the poor. And over the years, Acumen has invested $126 million in 126 companies and has had a successful track record in sourcing and executing investment opportunities in the clean energy, healthcare, and agricultural sectors. In her book, Jacqueline writes, I wrote this book because I believe that our fragile, unequal, divided, yet still beautiful world deserves a radical rejuvenation. This revolution will ask all of us to shift our ways of thinking, to connection rather than consumerism, to purpose rather than profits, to sustainability rather than selfishness. We must, she says, awaken to see workers not as inputs, the environment not as our personal domain, and shareholders not as all-powerful. And we need to move away from old models of doing what is right for me, and assuming it will turn out right for you. And there's a lovely quote separately that Jacqueline has made, which is, you should focus on being more interested than interesting. So on that note, I have great pleasure now in handling over to Charlotte. Thank you. Um, thanks, Roddy. Um, it's absolutely my pleasure uh, to be able to open up the questions here but then um, there'll be plenty of time for you all uh, to have questions. So Jacqueline, thank you so much for joining us as Roddy said. Now he's given us an insight there into why you wrote this book but just to, to get into that a bit more I've got the book here. Well, um, why this, why now this book and as you were writing it who were you really writing it for? Thank you, Harriet, um, and thanks, Randy, for that lovely introduction. Um, so I started writing actually a few years ago, um, Harriet, when I've been doing this work for 35 years um, in some of the toughest places on the planet. And, um, and it was really a night when I was back in Rwanda, which is where I had started my work in trying to create real change. I created the first microfinance bank in Rwanda. And suddenly I was back almost to the week uh, presenting to the president and his ministers this $70 million impact fund to bring 10 million people off grid energy. And part of me was thinking, you know, how funny life is and what am I doing here? Um, there'd been a lot of tragedy in those 30 years, a lot of failures, a lot of setbacks. The genocide uh, to, <laughs> to start, um, real senses of betrayal and um, everything like that. And, um, and suddenly this young woman walked up to me and said, Ms. Novogratz, I think you knew my auntie. And I said, really, what was her name? And it turned out her aunt was one of my co-founders of this microfinance bank way back in 1986. Um, but for pushing for women's gender equality way back then, um, she paid the price of getting killed in a hit and run accident. I hadn't really heard her name. And um, I said to this young woman, who are you and what do you do? And she said, my name is Monique and I'm the deputy general of the central bank. And I realized, Harriet, in that moment that um, 
Had you told me as a 25 year old that 30 years later, we wouldn't just have improved women's economic situation, um, but that a woman would be running the financial system, I'm not sure I would have believed you. And it struck me right then that I was there to continue work that my co-founder Felicula had started but couldn't complete. And it was actually my job to take on dreams so big, I might not complete them. Um, but what I could do was to write a love letter of sorts to the next generation. And so that's really who I was thinking about. Um, and then as I wrote it, my editor said, you know, I'm older than you are and this is what I wanna bring into my life. And so um, that's when I started to realize this is, about, this is about change, that if we keep focusing on technical solutions to our material poverty, we're missing the point. We will never have systems that really allow us universal dignity. We've got to focus on our poverty of spirit. Well, there's so much in what you said that, that, that I could start with. One is to just to mention to those who perhaps don't know that you, you had only been a, a, in the banking, you were a banker until the age of 25, but you were, you were only 25 when you decided that no, that, that wasn't enough. You wanted to apply the learning that you had to something that meant more to you, that had more impact to you. And, and to, to follow on from, from what you talk about early in the book, you talk about your, your Catholic upbringing at school and the inspiration that you took from the female saints. And then you, you also describe your, your own spiritual journey and how you came to, rather than to attach yourself to one doctrine, to feel much more at home with the, the divine as, an, as a kind of concept and understanding. How, how important do you think embracing that spiritual peace is to our kind of progression in business? And even to those of us who work in a purely for-profit environment? Um, no one's ever asked me that. Um, and thank you for that. Uh, I think it's very important um, in, in an age, you know, in my generation, we got uncomfortable talking about religion at all. Um, and in part because we, we were raised in a generation where there were saints and sinners, good and bad. Um, when you go through something like a genocide and you see that people that you have worked with to build an institution of social justice um, get killed, be bystanders, and actually help plan a genocide, you suddenly have to confront that we all have you know, monsters and angels inside each of us. And that our systems are too often focus just on the, 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 the greedier sides of us. We have this whole other side of us. And so if we move all the junk that gets away from us, all of us want to be good, I believe. And there's a way to put human dignity and the things we can't measure into the mix of the, the families we build, the communities we create, the, the, the corporations that we build. But for the last 50 years, we've pretty much only focused on what we can measure, which is profit. And we've elevated stake shareholders to all powerful. And, um, and it is that understanding that this isn't working for us anymore as a world. Um, but to truly move to a stakeholder model does not have an easy algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, we have to work on how we measure what we can't count. But in the meantime, we have to be much more intentional about giving voice to the environment, to the poor, to our employees who may be halfway across the world. And that's it may, you know, call it a spiritual act, call it a moral act, but it's certainly a moral frame um, that, that brings you to a different set of uh, decisions in how you operate. Yeah, and it invites a whole other dimension um, to, to, the, to the business conversation. And um, uh, early on, you, well, throughout the book, there are many, many stories of the in, very real challenges that you faced as, as Ackerman, but more, you, you tell the stories through the, the eyes of the people that you meet um, across Africa and Asia mostly, um, but a lot of them also Americans too. Um, you, you say to rule out failure is to rule out success. So I wonder if you could illustrate for me what kind of failure has led to you to, to, to make that statement. <laughs> well, I could, I have a litany 
period of, um, of you know, we're, we were trying to build a sector, um, impact investing, that had never existed before. And I will actually say, even just to go back, because even though I talked about the moral framework, there are structures. Over time, we had to bring in the, the, the first line of our, our manifesto, which is it stand, we start by standing with the poor. And so in every investment committee meeting that we have, we ask ourselves before we go into the discussion, is this truly impacting the poor? And um, that took a long time and a few failures uh, before we could really integrate that into the work that we do. When I started Acumen, there was no impact space. The nonprofit sector felt that um, the idea of investing in low-income markets made you equivalent to a ravenous venture capitalist. And the for-profit sector would sometimes see me as a Marxist, sometimes in the same day. And I actually think that's when you know you're onto something, but you don't quite understand yet how to build it. And, um, and so I couldn't find anything. The first, year, first three months, I looked with my little team of two interns and me, we looked at 700 organizations in both for-profit and non-profit into which we might invest, and we found nothing. And then a very wise man, I think he was the, the CEO of Kaiser at the time, he said, Jacqueline, just start. Go for mediocrity if you have to, because you'll learn from it. And I was like, mediocrity? Um, how could I do that? And he was right. And so our first three investments um, didn't work. But not only did I learn about the intricacies of investing in markets where people make $2 a day and there's no bureaucracy, there's no infrastructure, financing, trust. But I also learned more technical, you know, technical things that it fundamentally changed us. So, and it continues. Because then we were building sectors that never existed. Off-grid solar, how do you price it, et cetera, et cetera. The only way you learn is to try. And so if you rule out failure, so do you rule out success. And, and, and in the trying, you weren't only obviously putting you you were also having to fundraise at, at the same time so uh, I'm fascinated and have been like throughout my career by the nexus between philanthropy business and um, author local authorities or, or government um, I, I feel that in the UK we we haven't got that mix right at all the third pillar gets involved in the conversation far far too late in in your what you've created um, you've force these thick pieces together. Tell me why Acumen has to have philanthropy uh, as part of its mix and you can't exist with a pure investor investment as, as we would understand it. Because we, there's a reason that in 2007, a billion and a half people had no access to electricity. A billion and a half people, 130 years after Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. Traditional investors are looking for profits. Um, and so they too often overlook the poor or they exploit the poor. The charities felt that, as I said, it was so uncomfortable, this idea that you would have a for-profit company to come in to try to solve a problem for very, very poor people. And so there was a lot of rejection. Government was part of subsidizing kerosene, which people paid 50 cents a day for. If they could subsidize that kerosene, poor people would vote for them. And so it wasn't just big bad government or big bad corporate or the charities that were against this idea. Everybody was against this idea. Um, and so we needed the philanthropy to find the right character, the right entrepreneur um, who would immerse himself. And in this case, there were two of them immerse themselves and understand how to solve the problem from the perspective of the poor, their realities. Recognize that they already were paying 50 cents a day for kerosene. This actually could have been an easier one, but to pretend that, they're, that they are you know, just waiting for someone to help them, it diminishes them. And so we put in um, $5 million of our philanthropic back capital. We were part of helping them raise philanthropy additionally. So there was another 5 million to build markets. Then as we grew, um, Roddy talked about the 130 million of our philanthropic backs. We also have another 150 million now of for-profit funds. Because even as they were growing and they needed to raise 
50 million at a time. Nobody wanted, no traditional investors were still ready, but we needed big, bigger capital. So we went into that area. And, um, and I think, Harriet, that's why I talk about the importance of investment as a means, not as an end. Um, that too often we start with the kind of capital we have rather than the problem we want to solve. And I think it is to every corporate leader, philanthropist, and govern government leader, frankly, all of us, to understand where markets work and what are the dangers um, and perils of capitalism too. Where do markets fail? And then I think we'd have a much more robust and honest conversation about how we actually solve the problem. And so it's been a 12 year journey. They've brought 100 million people um, light and electricity. They've also started a movement. So now we're helping a group of, we're the largest off-grid investor in the world now. And so we're helping others um, raise an emergency fund and as, for this moment of COVID. And as we are doing it, we're learning that there are now 500 companies in the off-grid space, representing about 350,000 jobs um, across Africa and South Asia. And so I, I started to realize that if you have, find the people with the courage and you can back them, um, you don't just change the lives of a few people. You can actually not just build a company, but you can help improve a nation. So in the story of, of D-Light, you also explain about listening and, and really listening to the people that, whose problems you're trying to solve. And I think there's a whole piece in that that I'd like to unpack with you a bit about your journey with real listening and, and what, what that means. Because we think we're good at listening, don't we? But we think we're good at listening and 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 i fancy myself a really good listener at, after all this time but i still really make mistakes and um i think what what we're modeling right now in the world our leaders too often um is to enter every conversation from a place of certainty um righteousness rather than in, inquiry and humility and um as a result we're just flinging opinions at each other and we're pushing further and further into each other's corners when it comes to low-income people that don't have voice and frankly don't expect you to ask a question and certainly if they hear a question from you and you have more privilege they give you the answer they think you want to hear and that took me a, a while to learn um, and i talk about it a lot in my first book because i missed it so often what was so spectacular about Delight um, is that they started with who people were, what they cared about. And I'll never forget um, sitting in a, in a hut with, an old, with a granny um, who had had the light. And, um, and this, Harriet, is after hundreds of visits to women who were the recipients of, of project, charity projects. And they would always tell you how amazing everything was. And this woman talked about how much she loved the, right, the light, but then she's like, I said, Tedesia, why don't you tell Mr. Small, who was this big uh, regional director, how it could be improved, what you don't like. And she just rattled off these different improvements. And suddenly I was watching this tiny elderly woman talking to this enormous Australian man, um, not with any sense of pandering or begging, um, but she wanted to improve her light. And he was not standing there with that arrogance or that self-puffery of like, look how much good I'm doing. He wanted to earn her trust as a customer. And that, is, that was a huge moment for me in recognizing that when we listen in a true way, we plant the seeds of our individual transformation. And, um, and we gotta do that better as a world. Yeah, and you, you, you talk about that in terms of, um being willing to embrace the uncomfortable and your, your acumen fellows and some of the kind of exercises that you take them through. And I think those are really interesting exercises that as we all, as business leaders and, and, and people working in our tiny corners, um, could embrace 
uh, to think about actually whether we're listening to each other and whether we're understanding diversity from different perspectives. So I wonder if you could um, um, explain to us a little bit about what you do with the, with the fellows. Yeah, so when we started doing fellows, and that was the recognition halfway in building Acumen that we could get really good at developing the tools of capital, how to use different types of capital for different needs. But um, if you didn't accompany that with human capital, um, our companies often stumbled. And so we started a fellows program really to support the companies that we were invested in, but then the, um, our advisors in, in Pakistan, India, East Africa um, said to us, we want more leaders like this. And, and so can you build a program just for our young leaders? And so we started to do that about um, eight years ago. We have 750 leaders now around the world. When I agreed, I said, yes, under one condition, um, we will identify those young people across race, class, ethnicity, religion, and, um, and that will be uncomfortable. Um, and so we learned a lot even in how you select for those regions where you have no access to internet, um, where people are, are more orally based than written based or don't have a, a, a good command of English. But um, I would say understanding identity and not coming into the room just with your sense of, again, what's right and what is wrong from your own identity, um, but starting to use identity as a tool to connect rather than a weapon to divide. So we teach them the, the, really the insights of Amin Malif, Malouf, the French Lebanese writer, who talks about how we all have multiple identities, but that when one part of our identity is threatened, it rises to the top and that's all we become. Um, and so how do we have them just list out, who are you? You know, um, I'm a woman, I'm Pashtun, I'm Pakistani, I'm um, an artist, I went to this school or that school, I'm a daughter, I'm a wife, I'm a, and then, um, and then we'll go around the room and say, who said man? Almost never does a man say man. Often women will say women. You know, why do you think that is? And so what are the identities that you hold most closely? And, uh, and then can you, when you go into a place with, with a stranger, rather than interrogating him, can you welcome them as, a, them as a friend by starting with a piece that you know you can connect on, even if it's as simple as a book you might know that they have read or your own whatever it is. And, um, and another is that we have them tell their stories. We call it the river of life. Um, it can take a really long time, but once you start to hear them tell their, these stories are extraordinary, then they become more human to each other. And the third, which I think is very relevant for right now, is um, this idea that if one side sees um, one truth and the other side sees the other truth how do you have a hard conversation and so it's that practice of recognizing a, even a partial truth in what the other side says having the courage to take a figurative step toward that person um, and seeing how often that opens the space for more conversation um, and uh and it's transformative and so now to see young people truly crossing boundaries um, with individuals they were raised to hate and partnering has been amazing. And, and Harriet, I would say it's not just for our fellows. We have a lot of corporate partnerships at Acumen. And so if you really want to partner, you got you to know who one another is. You got to know what you, your North Star is that you share um, and be really clear about what you bring and what you don't bring. Um, because this work is not a one-year project. Well, right. So we you, you patient capital, um, and we're so used now to a, a very short-termist approach to almost everything. Um, okay, we're starting to have conversations about the long term, but you've been you've been at this for some time now. So I, I found it really fascinating from a communications perspective, you know, the field I work in, like you said initially, you know, you found it hard to articulate exactly what, because when you talk about patient capital, you're talking about years and you're talking about small 
um, businesses or social enterprises, even worse, people don't trust them at all. You know, small thing, tiny impact, maybe 800 people affected first of all. And how do you communicate uh, that kind of um, ambition in a way that's credible in our short termist, uh, you know, headline kind of world? Yeah, that is, thank you. The, the, at the beginning, it was incredibly hard um, because it was a, I was, I was in a world where um, even though I was almost 40, um, Wall Street men particularly would say, Jacqueline, you clearly don't understand business. I make my money here and I give it away there. And so my pitch was, um, I want to take your philanthropy. We're going to invest in for-profit visit businesses for 10 or 12 years. Some will fail, but you know, the ones that will succeed will really succeed. And so I would say at the very beginning, um, the idea was so countercultural that you rely on a small group of early adopters, Harriet. Um, and I was very lucky. And I don't think all of them understood fully what we were doing, but they knew that what, how they were working wasn't succeeding. Now we actually have the kinds of numbers that get people's attention because we, while we've only invested about 125 on the, or 30 on the nonprofit side, we've moved about a billion dollars in capital that has changed lives of 300 million people. Um, we're influencing policy. We understand how, um, how these industries work and where they don't work. And we had to learn a lot too, that the only way you scale these, in most cases, is if you partner with government or you partner with um, corporations. And so I would say, going back to being interested, not interesting, um, and failing, we've really had to learn a new set of skills as we've built. But, um, we clearly aren't doing a good job at solving all of the problems from a top-down solution. Um, we need it, but we need to actually understand what that solution should be from the pe perspective of the people that we want to serve. And that doesn't happen either overnight. But um, as you get that insight, then there's no, then, then shame on you if you don't scale it. And that's where the top-down is so important to meet the bottom up. I'm very aware that lots of people want to ask questions. So Doug, I'm going to come back to you to take you to the next, uh, to, to one of the audience. Alan, perhaps if you could ask your question first. Sure, hi, hopefully you can see and hear me. I'm Alan Ellington uh, from Walter Scott and Partners. It's uh, nice to meet you, as it were. Hi Alan. My, so my question is, the kind of big picture um, around your book, I've, I very much agree with, right? We need some big, kind of change in the way we approach things but what i kind of think i see at the moment in the world is a retrenchment to nationalism a retrenchment to look after our own and so it, it's starting to feel to me like the kind of the previous globalizing expansionary fairly liberal approach to the world was sort of going in that direction potentially or could have been could have continued to go in the direction that you talk about it feels to me like we're going in reverse a little bit so, so how do you kind of feel about the, the prospects going from here? Um, the honest answer is I feel like we are at this precipice between real peril and real possibility. Um, because I agree with you, Alan, that, um, and what I saw, you know, in, in, in Rwanda in an extreme way was how easy it is when we're feeling insecure for demagogues to prey on the broken pieces of us, our fears and insecurities. And, and that's, that's really where we retrench and sometimes can do terrible things. And so um, on the other hand, there is a whole group, um, particularly of young people who recognize that we will not solve climate change um, on a nationalist basis. COVID, if anything, should show us that if we're trying, if we're stealing um, vaccines or even fighting for who gets to man manufacture the vaccine doesn't really matter because until we have a world where all of us have protection from COVID, none of us have protection from COVID. And so um, I think that in a, in a funny way, this moment is so begging for the global solutions and that there is um, an enormous group of young people around the world that want that, 
but they also want to feel rooted locally and they should. We all feel a deeper sense of belonging in that way. And so how do we bring forth those narratives that are locally rooted and globally connected? And again, in the same way, we think about what kind of capital do we need to solve our problems? How do we parse these solutions that recognize it's a complicated moment, but that there's huge opportunity? And so um, how do I feel? Honestly, I feel both are possible. Um, how do I want to act is to fight really hard for that narrative, which I believe actually includes more people in it. Um, it's a more nuanced voice, so it's actually a, a more difficult voice to bring into the world. But it is where we see the solutions to our problems. So thank you for ask, asking that question. Thank you. Jacqueline, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Paul Gray. If uh, you would ask your question, please. Good afternoon, Jacqueline. Um, I, I'm so fascinated by your, uh, your point about uh, whether one would declare oneself as a man or not. I looked back over the whole of my history that I could remember and I can never remember doing that. So I, I, you may say something about that. My question, however, is um, you spoke about listening properly. I, I'd like to get an example from you of a time when you feel you didn't listen properly. And I'm particularly interested in why that happened and what the impact was and what, what we uh, as a group here today could all learn from that, if you would. Um, thank you, Paul, and thanks for your humility too. Um, I would say, um, you know, in the book, I actually write about this young man named Vimal Kumar, who I talked about last night. I mean, I talked to last night. Um, Vimal comes from the scavenger caste, which is the um, the, the, the people in India who've been consigned to pick up human waste out of the trees and scrape it off the streets. Um, truly the, the lowest of all the castes. And he'd just become an acumen fellow. And I, as I said, I really fancy myself a great listener. And um, I, it was a very hot day in Mumbai and I was waiting in a coffee shop for him to come. And uh, it was about 10 past the hour and he still hadn't come in and suddenly it dawned on me oh my goodness maybe maybe for some reason he doesn't want to walk in here alone and so he came early hoping that he would catch me uh and i had been in the i'd been having meetings all morning and so i went outside and sure enough there he was and i gave him a big hug and we went inside and um i said and i was you know wanting i only had 15 minutes left so i was like hey Vimo, Tell me what you want. Do you want a coffee? Do you want a croissant? You know, and he said, no, 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 just water. And we sat down and um, we had a, an amazing conversation um, with a lot of really deep listening. But it wasn't until later that I realized um, that I was listening really well to his emotional needs, but not necessarily to his physical needs. And, um, and we later talked about the whole experience and both in terms of the beautiful parts. He said it was the first time I'd been, you know, someone who just didn't know me and just touched me, hugged me, and what that felt like. He said, but um, I didn't ask for anything because I didn't have any money in my pocket. That was the reason I didn't go in, because what if they asked me if I wanted a coffee and if I wasn't buying anything, they would kick me out. And he said, and then um, when you asked, I didn't know if you wanted me to pay or not. And I couldn't bear that risk. And so, Paul, I would say that, you know, like I said, I, I fancy myself so good at it. Um, and I, I didn't hear that part. And, and right now in the middle of all of the complexities with politics that are going on um, in the United States and increasingly around the world, I think where I've had some misses is generationally, where my generation, um, was raised to do the work. Don't talk about it till you've actually done the work. Um, and, and, and think through before you move. The next generation um, puts everything on social media very quickly. 
and um, and and by not interrogating that um, as a leader inside an, an organization, and I'm sure this is happening all over the, the corporate world, the nonprofit world, um, there was a misunderstanding that could have been much more easily under, dealt with. Had I had I had I gone to just understand like what is happening here, and that had nothing to do with I think anything but generation. And so I think that right now we are really having a big generational, you know, my generation that grew up with watching the Berlin Wall fall down. I worked in socialist countries. I know um, the, the good parts of it and also the perils of it. And so, um, and so I think we could have a more nuanced conversation if we came generationally to the table from a place of inquiry. Um, it's hard. Jacqueline, thank you. Um, we have another question from Ryan Davis, if, if I could ask you to ask your question. Thanks, Doug. Hi, Jacqueline. It's wonderful to be part of an audience with you. Um, I'm, I'm dialing in from South Africa. So um, we, we understand um, Africa's very, comes with different challenges as does a lot of the, a lot of the uh, developing world. Um, but maybe just a question to you at this time is, uh, who are the current leaders, the current world leaders that you look to that are displaying the, these qualities that we talk about? Where, where do you see the hope in terms of partnerships um, with nations joining with you in moving forward? Um, and maybe just taking that a bit further, who are the governments and business leaders that are standing with you um, united and really on board with your vision at the moment. Thanks, thanks so much, Ryan. Um, and and I was very lucky to do work in South Africa in 97, 98 and learn so much from the country. Um, you know, it's almost cliche because we're all kind of desperately hanging on to actually Scotland's first minister, um, Jacinda Ardern, Angela Merkel, not because they're making perfect decisions, but because they are, they are articulating the decisions they make, having listened first and having um, a real sense of clarity and transparency and truth when they talk to, 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 to their community and the global community about the, why they made those decisions. Um, the, on the corporate side, I would say, um, we actually partner with many corporations and some of the most morally courageous people that I have met who are um, fully on board with these ideas are in corporations, um, which often means they're very isolated within the corporation. And I think part of partnering is to understand who those people are so that we can help them. Because otherwise, we'll get very, very far down a, um, a co-investment in a company that will protect the price on a supply chain to a farmer, to a group of farmers. And then um, right at the last minute, there's a very uncomfortable conversation about basis points that, that makes the corporation pull out. Um, and so um, how do we do a better job at making those partnerships? I'm speaking tomorrow with Humdi. Lukaya from Pravani, um, and when he gave 10% of his company to his employees, his real focus on hiring refugees and immigrants. So it's not just the philanthropy, it's the way that he's integrated in, into the business. Paul Pullman of Unilever is on the, my advisory, um, Alan Jopi, who is the new CEO, um, we have a real partnership with them. Bain, Bain um, EY, um, both are companies that have really worked with us on developing strategy and talent systems. Um, I mean, it's a long list that of, of corporations. And when young people say, how do you make the decision um, as to will you work with the corporation and will you not work with the corporation? My response is, are they on this journey? Do they want to shift to a stakeholder model? Because if it is a perfection test, 
we won't be partnering with anyone. And frankly, I'm not sure anybody would partner with us. It is the test of, um, are you willing to fail and succeed try, and try these? Are you willing to have the hard conversations with us? Um, then we're all in. You ask your question, Sunil. Uh, we are try, trying to start this all party parliamentary group on pensions. And this is well, temporarily headed by Baroness Altman, the previous pension minister. And I, I have heard her say that of the 15 industrial sectors uh, that are ranked uh, in the UK uh, uh, in terms of their trustworthiness, as it were, uh, banking is at the very bottom. Banking and financial services is at the very bottom. So pensions like the environment are an issue that affect all of us sooner or later. Now, the industry that we trust the most in, with our money is the one that is trusted the least. So how, does, how do you square that circle? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for asking the hardest question. I, mean, I think this is where we both have to um, really demand more accountability. And it was a, um, it was such a um, uh, travesty in the financial crisis of 2008 that we had um, no real holding to account of the big financial institutions. And, um, and I spoke to a number of um, Wall Street leaders who would talk about um, how other people were doing this stuff, but they never did anything illegal. Um, very few really came up publicly, which would have been so profound for all of us to say that while I didn't do anything illegal, I also didn't do what was right. We're not having those conversations. Mm. Um, and I think one of the reasons that, that our financial system is, is least trusted is that distance really does dull the moral imagination. And so the people who are making our decisions are looking at computer screens um, and looking at price, you know, go, the profits and losses. Um, it's very, very far away to the supply chain that goes way down to the smallholder farmer. And um, my hope is, and that's again, Sunil, why I keep coming back to this idea of moral revolution, not from a sense of, you know, some prescribed rule from a higher authority, but the willingness to put human dignity at the center and the sustainability of the earth and then build the right systems and celebrate the role models that are doing it. What's, what's heartening to me at this moment in history, and it goes back a little to Alan's question, is that um, I do see a whole new um, and large um, group of young people who are turning capitalism on their heads and building businesses from that start by understanding production costs of farmers, ignoring global commodities prices, building in a system and they aren't yet working um well in some cases they're working with big companies but they're still working with 100 200 million dollar companies that are now agreeing to pay more um for quality goods and services we need more of those examples and until the whole system changes we need those individuals who are who are, are brave enough to build it and we need to find ways to support them um because they're there I think 70, the most popular course at Harvard Business School right now is reimagining capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, there is a generation that wants to do this differently and, um, and, and the older generation needs to get on board or let them take it to the next level because uh, the shareholder only approach isn't working. And, and so I am heartened to hear the right language um, by the business roundtable, I think it's a huge step forward. And now we need to build those uh, real business models and celebrate them um, so that we together start to put this into action. So thank you for that question. So I have a first question from Nick Koonsberg, if he could ask his question, please. And then I'll ask and leave it to Harriet to ask the final question. Thank you. Um, I want you to know that you are the lodestar 
for Alistair Davis, who's the Chief Executive of Social Investment Scotland, which I chaired um, for six years. He's been extremely successful and as a visionary leader, you are due much of the credit for his journey. He was inspired by you at uh, a short course at Harvard, I think in 2011. Um, my question relates to actually what you've just said about the new language emerging, because here in Scotland, we particularly in Social Investment Scotland are increasingly aware of the interest of the millennials in a totally different, what I call postmodern capitalism model, whether that's social, uh, social enterprise, whether that's employee management and employee ownership. Um, I don't know, and I, I was really very interested to know your views uh, about these trends on a worldwide basis. Thank you, Nick, and give my best to Alistair. You, you humble me, thank you for that. Um, on a worldwide basis, it is alive and well. Some, one of our best examples for employee ownership is coming out of Pakistan. Um, Latin America is where I'm seeing the most work done, both on worker participation, as well as on, um, on some of these, the flipped model of, of starting with producer costs rather than global commodities costs. Um, one of our companies in Latin America is now um, sourcing a lot of Valrona chocolates, um, cacao, uh, built in this way. And so um, across Africa as well, that's really where you're seeing a lot of innovation with mobile banking. Safaricom, just during the crisis, um, made the pretty, cool, pretty radical move given that 40% of the mobile, of the GMP of the country, goes through the mobile banking um, of Safaricom's uh, uh, cell phones in um, Kenya. And during COVID, they, they ended all transaction fees um, because it was the right thing to do. So you're starting to see these um, role models um, still fairly on an episodic basis, but growing in every continent of the world. And that really excites me. And then when you do see New Zealand, Finland, Scotland, um, Iceland, I can't remember the fifth, but I believe there are five smaller countries coming together to really look at a generative economic model. Um, that's where we see that it's possible. And, um, and so I'm all in to work with the big corporations. We also need to show the possibility. And I think we do that better often um, when we start smaller and, um, and grow it. So thank you. Thank you. So my final question, again, on a topical subject, thinking about the protests um, that we're seeing carrying on in the States and also that have been taking place here. In your book, you talk a lot about, um, about privilege and perspectives. And just a short quote, you say, privilege can deafen us to those who feel less worthy or valuable. Those for whom the system works, in inverted commas, can easily become accustomed to the world rolling out the welcome mat. It goes on, but that's just a small piece from it. But how can we then, those of us who know that we sit in that blind spot, how can we use our privilege now most effectively do you think? Thanks, Harriet. Um, I think that when we see a whole generation, and now there's more than just the younger generation in the streets, not just in the United States, but around the world, we have to ask ourselves, what are the words, again, can we listen, not just with our ears, what are the words beneath um, this movement? And it's, I, I appreciated when Doug said, it's full of pain. It's full of just wanting to be seen. And so I think we start with privilege by just listening. And then it's to recognize that our privilege um, does um, entail responsibility for all of us at different levels. And we too often think about that in terms of money and not enough in terms of our social capital. 
how do we extend our social capital to those um, who don't have it, to give them platform, to give them voice, to raise them as role models and tell a different set of stories. Boy, would I like to see the media tell more nuanced stories. Um, and, um, and how do we really engage in truthful conversation um, as well so that they, we can build trusted partnerships into the future? What, what saddens me is when people of privilege um, apologize for their privilege, feel guilty for their privilege, and don't do anything. If ever there were time for us to recognize our privilege and use it, um, and to be the bridge that extends first, it's, it's now. And, um, and seeing some of that happening in real ways is also what gives me hope. Um, though it's not an easy hope, it's a hard edged hope filled with an understanding of the realities of what we do actually face as a world if we, um, if we don't change and extend not just opportunity, but the ability for everyone to participate in that opportunity. Um, we have all the tools we need. We have all the skills we need. We have the, the knowledge. Now the time for our moral imagination and our, um, and our willingness to try. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Um, the book is Manifesto for a Moral Revolution. You can find it online. Um, it's a beautiful and inspiring read. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass back to Roddy now. Jacqueline, it's, it's been a, a real pleasure. And I know you're, when you were talking about inspirations and, and models, your very high regard that you mentioned in your book for Eleanor Roosevelt and what she did in the face of adversity to affect change. And in your comments and in your, your conversations with the people calling in and, uh, and the way that Harriet was putting your questions, you really are an inspiration that all of us can do something about the, the difficult world that is still full of hatred and misunderstanding. Some of that misunderstanding and hatred generated unfortunately by world leaders in certain countries. But uh, I was glad that you pointed out Angela Merkel and also the Prime Minister of New Zealand as iconic women who have made a difference. And uh, to that list of iconic women, we heartily and unanimously uh, select and add you. And we're so grateful to you for being with us today. And I would like to thank you for joining us from the United States on this call with people from all around the world. Thank you. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here. And, um and to participate in it. And I just wish everyone good luck with whatever you all are doing because we are so needed. In the next 10 to 20 years, we will decide what the world will be like, whether we will succumb to the dangers of catastrophic climate change, whether we will rip ourselves apart with divisiveness, fear of one another, whether we will allow inequality to push us even further, or whether we will find ourselves in each other, build institutions in which we all matter, create a world for all of us. We know that our old institutions have run their course, but we've yet to reimagine how to replace them. What's needed is a new set of skills, one that recognizes that the new organizations requires us to master skills of listening, identity, holding opposites without rejecting either. We've got to learn a new art of storytelling and how to use markets rather than letting markets control us. We need a generation willing to take the best of those institutions and create things that are even better, more just, more inclusive, more sustainable, more beautiful. And the good news is that you're all out there. You know that there's a lot of brokenness, but in that is the most incredible opportunity to serve, to be of use, to find those solutions. It is exactly in the dark times when we find our best selves and ultimately where we find our deepest meaning. More than that, 
It's where we find the solutions that will take the world to its next chapter. One that I believe that if we so choose, can be much better than anything that has come before. I'm Jacqueline Novogratz, and I want to invite you to join me in a course about the moral imagination and what it really takes to make change in this world.